When it comes down to the question of what we want people to see, it's, it's not really a question that I can answer. We're up in Mishkagogmang First Nation, which is just south of Pickle Lake, up Highway 599 in uh, the high north of Ontario. We're just about as far north in the province as you can go by car. I'm in Mish because I was fortunate enough to come and paint on three doors. Um, one which had been vandalized with very negative colors and words, and we're just here to uplift them a bit. In partnership with the Muscle White Gold Mine of Gold Corp, we were able to secure some funding to bring up Mick Michel to Mishka Gogaman to do a mural on the doors. But we haven't designed anything. We haven't thought about what the design is gonna be. We haven't planned anything. What's really special about that is that we're going to engage the most that we can with the, the members of the community to see uh, what it is that needs to come out. So when we first arrived uh, a little bit earlier today, we spent some time at the school. Uh, so we were talking to some of the kids. We talked to the grade five, six, seven, and eight, and then the alternative education class and the three kids who are registered in high school uh, here in the community to get their ideas uh, about what they want to see. We talked to chief and council last night and we had the chance to just talk. What is it that, that they hope to see in this? And so the ideas of respect, of resiliency, you know, if, if we want them to feel proud, if we want them to feel a sense of respect, a sense of belonging, that's what we're gonna try to put in there. So my intentions, I don't have any intentions. My intention is to leave something on the door that, that the community's gonna like, uh, and, and to create something that the, rest of the, the, the country can use to learn about this community. They gave me lists, they gave me songs, they gave me stories. They stop by every day with suggestions. I've been so fortunate that they've participated and the members of the community. I've just been open to me and been so nice. Was not expecting that at all. All the community members I've met so far are like that, which is weird. Like people who are from here, I should say. I know if someone would walk into my community and say like, hey, I'm here to uplift you, I'd give them the finger and be like, who are you? So to see how the members here are just incredibly kind. I don't think there's any other words. And the people are proud of Mish. And with reason, like I wish I was from here. I was really surprised to see the kids too, how wise they are. Like yesterday morning I was super tired. You know, I was just like stressing out, making sure that I'm painting something that I'm, I'm remembering all these lists they gave me. And this little four-year-old walks up to me and she's like, you need a hug, and just squeezes my neck, not even my body, just like my neck and my head. And she's like, yeah, you needed a hug, and walks away. Like, no hellos, no nothing. She just knew and then came back halfway through the day and was like, I'm here to help paint. I'm like, wow. <laughs> my name is Lorreen Wasikizik. I'm one of the band council for Mishki Dogman. Just recently elected again after a staggered positions of council in the previous years. And this year I look forward to working with the chief and council again because I have a lot of ambition to um, try and unite the community together in terms of where we want to be. I am very grateful for the wall to be done because it tells a story of the whole community. Like when I used to walk by there, like it looked so um, beat up and just the energy that you got from me you know, being like passerbys, you know, it just represented the brokenness of the community before. And now that it's all like everything's coming together with the mural and um, everybody is stopping by honking, you can just feel that positive vibe now, like everybody's very energetic about it. So it's good to see and I'm glad it's happening. I've always wanted, always looked at that wall and said, oh, you know, now I can look at it and say, cool. <laughs> I'm really happy about this painting, yeah, which is especially the, the red, the white, black, and the yellow paint, yeah, and the symbol for for uh, foundations of mankind. Yeah? And I really appreciate that you guys put on that, on that wall. They've just been so open and so... We, we're in the city and we have these walls and we're guarded and we're fast paced and we think about like what we have to do versus like these kids are just, let's try, let's discover, let's be curious, let's... You know, like Cortez, for example, I was in the fire truck and his instinct was to jump up and like he was almost like jumping on my lap, on me being like, I want to drive it as well. And how many of us would think that, but just sit down and not do anything. 
just be like, wouldn't that be cool to like do this or do that? Versus these kids, they're just so curious, they're going for it. Cause like nobody's gonna give us this opportunity, we're gonna kick down the door and take it. And I think that's like the biggest lesson I could take from them and just to like take that wall down, be less guarded. Because one of the realities is that people in, in Southern Canada really have a skewed image of what life is like in, in Northern Ontario and some of the Northern regions of our country. Uh, we hear too many news stories that, that are kind of down in, down in the ditch, you know? We're talking about drugs, we're talking about alcohol, violence, but the people here are, are some of the strongest, most vibrant, most welcoming people in, in any region of this country. Uh, and so really what we want to do is dispel some of the stereotypes that exist, but also, you know, give the community a chance to really speak out for what people here are actually like and what life here is actually like. And in the context of this truth and reconciliation and what is reconciliation and, and recognizing on Canada's 150th uh, anniversary that there's you know, 200 years of, of oppression uh, from governments towards Indigenous peoples, the very first step in that is building those gaps or bridging those gaps. And it's, it's having the chance for people from the South to see what's going on, but to meet people from the North and, and, and vice versa. So to leave something in the community that, that they're going to be proud of and, and feel that they've been very involved in, and then on the other side, having something that will be shared across the country to give a little a little glimpse to those in Toronto and in Vancouver and in Montreal about Mishka Gogomang and letting people know that there is an awesome community here of, of super strong, vibrant, resilient people. Uh, for many years, I noticed or I've heard people don't trust coming into our community. Just the way it's been labeled for many, many years ago is one of the baddest communities, I guess. The truth is, you know, we're First Nation people. We've come through a lot of grief, loss, and a lot of um, growing together. It's not who we are, just, you know, that's just stereotype, just like, um, it's just all media. Everybody's welcome to come here, huh? Mich come visit Mishki Gogamak, like, we invite them with open arms, like. Some teachers that, that we've worked with in the past, have told us not in details, but some stories they have heard when they first come to the community. They're so terrified to come in. They can really hear their heart and stuff. And then they see the graffiti on the highway and that, and that really scared them more. And of course, we're out here hunting before, huh? So, so it really scared them more. But after all, and they got to know them well, all right. Too many times when we talk about indigenous communities in Canada, we have the images of, you know, rundown houses, we have isolated communities, uh, you know, issues with drug and alcohol abuse, we have issues of violence, uh, you know, we talk about houses that are falling apart. And when we use these images, when we think about it this way, what we forget is that we have incredibly strong communities that have people who have survived in incredibly harsh conditions for thousands of years. And then you have, you know, a colonial system that comes in and imposes, you know, restrictions on where they can hunt and fish. And then we, we talk about the legacy of residential schools and of people who, who have caused incredible amounts of abuse and trauma to a generation of people. We have all these images in our head, but we, we seem to forget when we make apologies and when we talk about reconciliation that just because, you know, Prime Minister Stephen Harper apologized for the residential school or Justin Trudeau apologizes for the 60s scoop, it doesn't change that there was an entire generation of people that forgot how to be attached to the land the way that, that their families had been doing for thousands of years. So we don't take enough time to listen because this community in particular has been through very, very uh, difficult uh, situations. Um, the community was originally located on this land in the area here, and, and they were a little nomadic. And when the Hudson's Bay Company came in in the 1700s, they built a post right on the Albany River on Lake St. Joseph. In the 1900s, you had the treaties that came in, and when the treaty signers came to Mishke Gogomang, the, the person who was elected as chief asked two very simple questions. He said, one, Will we be able to use all of our traditional lands? Will we be able to have access to the lakes and to the forests? And two, on our reserve, 
this is our land. You won't be coming on there. And the Trini negotiator said that's exactly what it is. Well, the uh, Department of Indian Affairs at the time had an Indian agent in each community. And after a while, you actually had to get written permission to leave the reserve. Then after a while, the governments realized that there was gold up here. Now, the way that they worded it in this time is in the 1905 treaty, they didn't necessarily talk about who had access to the water and the lands under the water. So even though the Rat Rapids were in the middle of the reserve territory that was exclusively for the community at the time of the treaty signing, they built it there without the permission of the community and they flooded the community. Two years later, they gave reimbursement to the community for the lost homes at $800 per home. And, and again, in, in you know the 1930s, this is, this is a substantial amount of money. You had $1,400 that was given to the Department of Indian Affairs for having destroyed the trees that they would no longer have access to. And you had $100 that was given to the community to replace the band office. The Hudson's Bay Post was paid $19,000 for their damages. So after this, uh, the government in the 1930s uh, in the Great Depression really needed to stimulate the economy. So they decided to build Highway 599 up to Central Patricia so that trucks could access instead of using the boat. So they built a highway in 1956, right through the middle of the community. And in 1976, they approved the order and council to build the road. 20 years after the road was built, the government did all of their processes to legally have the right to do so. The governments of Ontario and Manitoba decided that they needed to pump more water into the hydro systems uh, through the south. So Lake St. Joseph is, is an important body of water, but it all flows up the Albany River straight out to the James Bay, and there were no hydro dams along the Albany. So the government decided that they were going to build up a wall and they were going to direct the water the other way. Well, uh, little did they know that the Albany was a source of life for thousands of people who lived in the region here. Now, Lake St. Joseph is so dependent on how much electricity Ontario and Manitoba are using. When Toronto and Winnipeg are using a lot of electricity, Lake St. Joseph is really, really low. When they're not, it's really, really high. And that difference is about eight feet. The land was now flooded again. So the community had to be moved for a third time. They moved them to Dog Hole Lake. And Dog Hole Lake is a tiny little lake that has no inlets, no outlets, there's no access to the river. So now if the community needs to go fishing and they need to go up the river or to other communities, they have to somehow transport all their belongings back to St. Joseph and then head out from there. So when you have this history of being thrown around all the time, Mishkagogomeng is really quite particular in what they've had to go through. But at the same time, it speaks to the resiliency of this community. I, I remember in reading the, the history of the community, there was one story that in the 50s, after the community had been moved for the third time, they said, well, the people of Mishnagogamang, of Osnaburg House, uh, as it was called at the time, are so strong-headed, are so adamant at defending their land, that let's just, let's just give them back that. Let's take away, let's clean it up, and let's give them their land back. So there's Dog Hole Park, just down the highway from, from where we are now, and that's actually where the warehouses were once located. So, you know, Mish has been famously known as one of the strongest and most resilient and most activist communities in, in the North. And when you get here, you see it in the community. You see it in the eyes of the people who are here. There's such a, a heavy history, but it's a proud history and it's a resilient history. These communities are still so strong. They're still so tight. And although there's challenges, and we can't deny that there's not challenges, there's, there's a support and a sense of community and a sense of belonging and a sense of love that exists in these communities that I, 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 I haven't seen in other places of the country or even the world. Self-interest versus uh, commitment. Especially with the young kids, uh, they'll, see, uh, they'll see what you're doing and they'll say, well, he's doing that. And they'll see you promote something positive and they'll try to follow your footsteps like especially when i do my cultural stuff like uh when i help out i, I do it for a volunteer basis i just volunteer do it help out or when i go out to community events from time to time i do help huh? that's the only reason why i came back is because i wanted to help my community i wanted to work with the kids because hockey is a real big thing for these kids here and that's basically all they like to do is just hockey one young man we met um, he's raising money to go for a hockey tryout and while he's doing that he's creating his own opportunities first of all which is key and second of all while he's doing that just training he's bringing all the youth with him all like the 14 to like 18 kids 
We're running with him. And then to play hockey, they follow him. Why? Because he stands tall, he is empowered. Just making sure that they have a way to empower themselves to create their own opportunities, I think it's gonna be so contagious. Because there's, there's a lot of people that, you know, grew up a real hard life here. Like with alcohol, or not even having their parents, or getting taken away, or just being on their own. Yeah, there's a lot of things said about us, and most of it's not true, but some of it is. It's just because of what everybody goes through on a daily. Alcohol is like a main thing in the res, so you know that's that's how the kids. That's how the kids. It's like a never-ending cycle, right? Once the kids see all the adults doing nothing and just drinking and just wasting their lives away, that's that's how the kids pick up, and that's. That's, that's like a big problem in Osnaburg right now is the drinking. I think another, another bad thing is that the gang affiliation stuff, you know, kids wanting to be gangsters, jumping each other, beating up each other and that, or even kids, like younger people beating up women. And that's pretty bad. You know, you shouldn't be doing that, but they learned that from the adults because it's what, it's what the kids see growing up and they, they have nobody, you know? They need people to come down here and are actually going to make a difference. My name is Connie Gray McKay. I'm from Mishkegomag First Nation. I was a band counselor for 10 years and I was a chief for 12 years. I think the biggest thing that I see when, when we talk about mental health is that it needs to be balanced with the um, understanding of how mental health was dealt with from a traditional perspective. We have a history of trauma. So there's an identified group of kids that have this um, idea that they're going to commit suicide, but I think at any point, any child can become a high risk. When you look at all the factors that children have to live with, they might have parents that are in addictions, that may be drinking, doing drugs, using up all their money so they don't have food, or they might not even have a home. Even just the stress of living out there, if you have an appointment in Sulukat, that's a whole day trip. And then the northern store with its high prices, it's a lot of stressors. It's so different than people that live in an urban setting where you can just walk down the street and, and get what you need. So when you have people who don't recognize that change is generational and that change will take time, we keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing them to make those changes quicker. And it, it almost, brings our communities further apart when we, you know, we in the South can't see the changes that are happening in the North and we still think, oh, they're still drunk, oh, they're still wasting money, oh, we're still, you know, giving them handouts for X, Y, Z. For one, for the person making those comments, it closes their mind. They're saying, no, I see the world this way, I understand it this way, it doesn't matter what's happening in the communities, I don't accept that those changes are happening. And then for those in these communities or for those who are trying really, really hard to make that generational change and to raise their kids, uh, you know, with respect to the culture, with respect to their land, with respect to traditions uh, and respect to themselves and, and to their elders and, and all of these really beautiful things that I believe should be, you know, commonplace in any society. Um, why would they want to keep making the change? If they're making such an effort and everyone's saying, ah, oh, they're still blah, 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 they're still doing this, they're still drinking, they're still wasting their time. Why would I want to invest my, my own time and my own effort in making these changes? So by doing that, we break us apart. We stop making a dialogue. And that's where things start to become a problem is when we don't talk to each other anymore. I think we're, we arrived uh, uh, and the vision of where the community is going to be going, collaborating with today's um, tools and stuff like that, the education and the economic development, and have, making sure that our, our youth are going to be set in well into the 20th century. Yeah, I think, you know, Mish, I guess, uh, has gone through a lot of change. We've done nothing wrong to deserve really bad things that uh, really good people did. So. I've asked my people, have we arrived at the crossroad? Is it time to, to make an adjustment to and what they hope to achieve in the coming, in the 20th century into a new world? Eh? I guess one of the first things that I don't really want to mention is that I was born and raised in Michigan. You know, that's my, that's my life. That's where my bloodline starts and will end. 
I really have a deep love for my community and I want the very best for it because you know we've lived our lives like you know I've lived my life where you know addiction was a big part of me and uh, all these abuses that we talk about and you know to be able to survive life you know you gotta have a really strong resiliency all the the residential school the abuses that we went through the, the addictions that I went through that's just part of my story it prepared me to be to to be who I am today to develop another story to change the story for the future generation I really believe and want a treatment center in our community because that's where you know when I was reading that going back to what I read, that the essence of life is how we make it, it will restore hope. I think that those would really be beneficial, especially to, to move our youth with more confidence of who they are, where they want to be, where they're going to go. Because you know, they're the ones that are going to move forward for us. We see the shift in the youth now. We just got to give them the power to do it. That's, um, that's, my, that's my determination, my dedication to my youth. You know, I see, I seen the walls that went up. I seen the laughter of, the, of our children. You know, that's, that gives you a lot of strength. I know that, you know, as, as I'm getting older, the more that my, um, the more that I see that, that I want the very best for my people and for my, for, for our children especially even more so for my grandchildren and the children that are, that are the future. So, you know, that's, what, that's how I feel, is that the unity is going to restore the hope in all of us. I'm going to First Nation people, it's so important that we tell our stories. If change is going to happen, it's us that must tell that story, our stories. It's not necessarily just blaming what happened, bad things happen, but in Canada, whatever happened to us as First Nation people, that is our collective history, and it is our collective responsibility to begin to address it. And I think that's the purpose of this video, is to get people to talk about what, what happened to them as people. As, as communities uh, and as families. Yes, we've encountered a lot of difficult difficulties within Canada, laws that are oppressing us, but that is the past, what we're looking at was where we are at today and what is it that we need to do together to, to move forward. You know, when I see young people saying they only, uh, uh, they only, they only recognize uh, the two little boxes, which is uh, 63A and 63B, which keep off my band. Huh? Uh, more or less change that mentality. Yeah? They don't exist on not only two little small boxes. We exist within our traditional area. In my belief, we are part of uh, you know environment, eh? We're people of the land. When I speak in my native language, that's the uh, foundation of our traditional territory eh? or existence. Eh? my na native language. Yeah. We need to start educating young people so you, you, so you and I can uh, go have a cup of coffee at Tim Hortons. I know I had a matter of fact uh, when I walked in, walked in any in restaurant down south, you know, the head's turned yeah? right away. I'm just a human being from a bush with long hair. Eh? That we can change that. Eh? My blood is red. I'm not quite sure yours is right too, you know. But now the younger generation really wants the change. They want to see that change. I think education will be the number one priority for um, the younger generation. We're right on the highway. We should have that opportunity where we have restaurants, gas stations, and like the economic development is such a high potential. That's what I want to see. That's what I think would will build a positive image and move forward. To make sure that happens, I think the MP has to visit more often, instead of coming around once a year, once around election time, <laughs> that they should come and, um, you know, spend time on the community just to see how it is. Like, we are, like, considered a third world uh, 
living conditions, and we are, you know, like we we do need uh, more recognition from the governments that seem to think that we can function on the funding that they give us already, which is never enough. We're always into deficits and trying to balance everything that we need. Give everybody the same playing field, not just be like, well, if you want to have the same playing field as us, come to the big city. There's 1,800 people here, like registered to Mish. I'm from a place that there's 300, and the resources that we had, wow, compared to here, and I don't understand who decided to give a value to a certain human so that they don't have the same playing field as us. That I don't get, I don't know where this started. I don't know who was that person who said, well, because you're from here and you practice this, this is your worth. What can we do? Well, I'll tell you what I can do. I can definitely make sure that around me, nobody is using any kind of vocabulary, derogatory terms, or feeding stereotypes that give people permission to take away those necessities, or to think it's okay to not be on the same playing field. Like, for example, using the word savage. Like, if you think that's okay, then you're surprised of what's going on in the States, or you're surprised of the condition that's going on now, Okay, wake up right now, right there. Any kind of small with, or cultural appropriation, using woodland art and making a profit of it when you are not from there, you've not had a mentor, um, being Amanda LPs of the world is saying like, it, it's okay to disregard these people. It's okay to think these communities are less than us. And it's those little acts that end up that we see Governments and leadership being like, well, we've always kind of treated this them this way. You know, we've we've basically created residential schools that say that we want to kill the Indian in them. Now, come, we don't have that permission. Stop giving yourself that permission, that privilege to excuse yourself from all the harm that been that's been done. We talk about making change, but we don't want to make the investment in the change. We haven't started implementing, uh, you know, new water systems in communities to stop oil water advisories. We haven't invested in schools. We haven't, we still have kids from Mishkagogamang who have to travel to Thunder Bay to go to high school. And, and you know, unfortunately, we've been talking about the kids who found themselves in the river in Thunder Bay, two of them have come from here. Because right now we're treating it like if we're trying to cure Europe. First of all, we're looking down at them like they are injured. And second of all, in Europe, every different country has all their own challenges. And if we treat it as a whole, we're going to miss so much. And we're going to fall back in the same pattern we did 50 years ago or 150 years ago. We're looking at kilometers, we're looking at money, we're looking at, you know, empty promises. The humanity is completely lost. Right now, the big problem is that many indigenous communities are not being treated like humans, point blank. Even the youth just, um, f I think it's from near Grassy Narrows, just did a rap song about, hey Trudeau, you promised us water, when is it coming? When you have access to all of these tools and not water, there's a problem. One thing that I really believe in is connecting young people. Uh, and I know in my own work, I, I'm extremely honored to work uh, with an organization that works with young people in all eight of the Arctic countries. And one of the values that we really believe in is communication between these countries. Because you'll have a kid who lives in Alaska and a kid who lives in Siberia and Russia. And when you think about those two countries, the United States and Russia, they're really polar opposites. But in those regions, they, they see very similar realities. And so in having that communication, we learn to understand and to learn about each other. And that's something that needs to happen here in Canada. Not even just to create the dialogue, but to create connections and to create friends. Because when you have a friend who comes from a different community, you're gonna take the time to learn about what that is and what that means to them. I really think that, that Ontario and that Canada as governments have a responsibility to not just invest in infrastructure and in education and in healthcare, which obviously they need to, uh, don't get me wrong, but they need to invest in creating opportunities for young people to connect. Because when you take a 14 year old, uh, who's still very, you know, soft brain, they're still growing, and you give them the chance to see a little bit outside of, of their reality, it kind of clicks that there's more to the world, that there's more to just what I've understood uh, growing up. And when you do that, you create people who are open, uh, who want to have that dialogue, and who are gonna go out of their way to make sure that they learn more. 
And when we do that, that's that's when change is going to start to happen. Ani. Miigwech, Mishomis. Miigwech, Nukamis. Miigwech, Gitchi Manitou. Miigwech, Miigwech, Miigwech. Before they would doubt me, knew nothing about me. Stuck in the limelight. Darkness around me, all that surround me, voices that out me. Now I gotta shine bright, so they can't live without me. Who's not ever gonna have a hater? Sober now, living life like a picture. Who's not ever gonna have to wager? It's so.